good morning. morning. Got a good crowd of folks with us this morning. We have visitors with us. We want to welcome you, let you know we're excited to have you this morning, worshiping our God together, and it has been an encouraging time that we've had together, an uplifting time, and now an incredible opportunity that we have to open up God's Word and to study from it. I want to start with this line this morning, this line this morning. Here it is. I I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett. This is the first line of the first letter sent by a poet, Robert Browning, to another poet, Elizabeth Barrett. And it is the very beginning of what will become, over the course of almost two years, roughly a year and a half, of correspondence between the two, 573 letters written back and forth. Back and forth until, which contains uh, estimately their courtship, because these letters lasted until September of 1846 when they were married and their letters stopped. Their son was asked once, why did your parents stop writing these incredible letters back and forth that we have the copy of still even to this day? And he would famously say, Once they were married, they were never apart and had no need to write letters to one another anymore. It is an incredible story, an incredible love story between two people, Robert Browning and the other Elizabeth Barrett. These letters with really interestingly that you can, if you want to travel to Wellesley College in England, see, and I don't know how great this picture is, but this is a copy of letter number one, what we just read at the very outset. I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett. You see there at the very outset. And then back and forth, back and forth. Now, why is it that I bring up these letters? Why is it that these letters are so popular? Why is it deemed that almost these letters are single-handedly called the greatest love letters of all time? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One reason you're going to be really familiar with even though you don't know that you're familiar with it. Because, of course, one poet writing 500 or so odd letters to another poet and back and forth, you would not be surprised that contained within them is some pretty incredible and eloquent moments of poetry. And so long after these letters have been written and after Miss Barrett Browning passes away early because of disease in her early 30s actually, there was compiled from these letters an incredible book of poetry with the incredible title of Sonnets in Portuguese. Now if that doesn't just grab you, right? Sonnets in Portuguese. Now, why? They weren't Portuguese. They were English. I don't know why it came out that way, but, you know, the incredible title of Sonnets in Portuguese. And if that title didn't grab you, the most famous of all sonnets contained in that incredibly titled book, Sonnets in Portuguese, is, you are ready for it, I know, the incredible, awe-inspiring title of Sonnet number 43. I mean, that gets you, right? Sonnet number 43. But sonnet number 43, pulled from a letter that Miss Barrett writes to Mr. Browning, begins with these words, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Now that is a line that I'm guessing we're familiar with. But what really is interesting to me as I was kind of going through this story a little bit this week is, if you're like me, that's all of that sonnet that you know. Just that first line. I want to share with you the final words of this poem. I want you to be thinking about as she writes to him, who will ultimately be her husband, 
just a few months later. Listen to these words. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight. For the ends of being and ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day. Most quiet need by sun and candle light, I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose. With my lost saints, I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose... I shall love thee better after death. An incredible poem written with a depth of love as we read it hundred years later. You can still feel. No one can question the depth of love that she had as she penned these words to her interest in Mr. Barron, or Mr. Brown, excuse me. A beautiful, heartfelt letter pinned to let him know just how deeply she felt for him. Now for us today, from one poem to another, a lot of the hymns that we sing in our song books begin as poems. A lot of, not all of them. A lot of the newer songs are written with that thought in mind, to be a hymn. But a lot of our older songs started out as a poem that maybe even sometimes later, as is the case with the poem we're going to talk about this morning, was put to music much later to be sung as a praise to God. But there's another poem that I want us to think about this morning. It is in our song book, and it is the, entitled, My Jesus, I Love Thee. It's written by a man by the name of Weather, uh, William Featherstone. And it was written in 1862, so a long time ago. But what's interesting about this poem specifically, an incredibly deep, heartfelt love letter to Jesus written by William Featherstone with an incredible depth that we're going to see together at age 16. It's an incredible thought. And he scribbles this poem out. He lives in Canada. It's where he was born and raised. And he scribbles out this poem and he folds it up and he mails it to his aunt who lives in Los Angeles, California. And she receives this poem. She loves it and she appreciates it and she wants to publish it. But the young William Featherstone says, you can publish it, but don't put my name on it. I don't want any credit for it. I'm just a young guy kind of throwing out words, you know, here and there. And so she publishes this into a magazine and publishes it anonymously. Years, decades later, decades later, a man by the name of Judson Gordon finds this poem in that publication written anonymously, loves it, puts music to it, and places it into a hymnal. Years after that, after some investigation, it's found out who the author of these words ultimately were. And I want us to think about this song this morning. I want us to do so by thinking about our own love for Christ. Specifically, as we've sang about this morning, our commitment to him. Now we're going to go through this song, a song that you're probably familiar with. It is a song and sermon idea that popped into my mind a couple of weeks ago. We were down in Florida at the Florida College Lectureship and if you're familiar with what happens there in the evenings on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday night, they have a lecture in the evenings at the gymnasium, and beforehand they have a big singing. And each of those three nights, a thousand, just over a thousand people were there. And on one of those nights, we sang this song. Now, with that many people, your, your senses are heightened and all of those things. But what hit me was, man, I haven't sang this song in a long time. And it was a powerful moment for me. 
so much so that I thought, ah, that's something I'd like to share. So I filed that away. As you see, not very long, just a couple of weeks ago. And so if you remember and were able to be with us last Sunday morning as we focus purely upon God's love for us, this morning, our love for him. The song is number 701 in your song books. I'm going to ask you not to turn there, and I'll tell you why I'm going to ask you not to turn there in just a moment. The words we'll put up on the screen. Stanza number one of that song reads as this. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all of the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I loved thee. My Jesus, tis now. A lot of you be familiar with the song, so you'll know that ending phrase will be repeated in each of the four stanzas, a powerful moniker. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. If ever I had loved thee this moment, I love you even more. A powerful thought. So the thoughts in this stanza, number one, in this stanza, very simply, we learn that we should love Jesus. Why? Why should we love Jesus? Because his love for us led him to be our savior, led him to be our redeemer. Now, a couple of things I want to point out specifically about this idea. And I want us to understand that Jesus, in the way that he lived, and the things that he did, and the actions that he lived out, he did not for himself, ever, always for us, for each and every one of us. And this morning, I want you to be thinking individually. I want you to be thinking personally. Yes, we can throw the giant umbrella out there. Jesus died for mankind. Yes, Jesus lived for man. Yes, that giant umbrella is there, no doubt about it. But this morning, make the umbrella just over you. Jesus died for you. He lived for you. He was raised from the dead for you. That's what Paul does. Think about what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. You want to talk about making something personal. As he's writing this very personal letter to his friend Timothy, he says this, verse 15 about Jesus. How personal does he make it? Verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. You think Paul makes it personal there? Jesus, he came in the world to save sinners. And Paul says, I'm at the front of that line. So the point that he makes is he came into this world to save me. And he came in this world to save you. He is a redeemer who paid the price. Out of sin and into a relationship with God. In the book of Galatians, again... The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says this about Jesus. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, Jesus, from the very outset was brought into the world to be a savior of mankind from the very beginning. The very first page of the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1 and the very first chapter. And talking about Jesus' birth, it's this, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people From their sins. It's Jesus' love. So why? Why have this deep-seated love for Christ? For God? Because He is our Savior. Because He is our Redeemer. Stanza 2. I love thee because thou hast first loved me. I want to say loved me. If you know the song, you know why. And purchase my pardon on Calvary's tree. 
I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. It's an incredible poem. Look for it. You will see the idea of our brow or Christ's brow in stanzas 2, 3, and 4. It's a recurring theme. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. This stanza we learn that we should love Jesus because his love was so intense for us, he was willing to die for us. It is the highest level of love. How do we know his love was intense? How do we know his love was huge? How do we know his love was deep? He was willing and did die for us. John will say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. John is making the point. He, he does so throughout the book. You want to you know what love is? You look to God. Number one, God is defined as love. He is love. You want to know how to love? You want to know what love looks like? You want to know how to love God, how to love each other? You want to know anything about love? You look to God. He is love. And so he says here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we see that and we know and then we know the story of him giving himself on the cross. Peter will say in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, um, this idea of purchasing our pardon on Calvary's tree, the cross, Peter will say, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. An incredible picture. And you take these first two verses and we think about why. Why should we love Jesus? It's because of what he has done for us died for us. He's our Savior. He has redeemed us. He has a, put us in a position to have our sins forgiven. And these two verses at the very outset lift up Jesus to the point that we should love him deeply because of what he has done for us. And now to verse 3. I, I ask you not to turn to 701 in your songbooks because in our songbooks inexplicably verse number three isn't there all of the songbooks that I have in my office and probably all the books that you have ever used in your life verse three is there and I looked longer than I should have because I didn't find anything right on why why would this song this verse be omitted and simply couldn't come up with anything but it, it shouldn't be because it is the punch of the song because verses 1 and 2 is pointing to Jesus and what he has done. But verse 3 begins now on myself. Because of God's love, I am now active in my love. So you have verse 3. I'll love thee in life. I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say... When the death dew lies cold on my brow again, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. So now this stands that we learn of our love for Jesus who has promised to be with us through life, and so I'll love him then and in death, and I will love him then. And so you have passages like this one in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, again the Apostle Paul in talking about his love and his relationship with Christ in his life, he says that I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now listen to him. The life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I live in the faith in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. The life that I live now is because of what Christ has done. And so for us, we live in the love of Jesus. 
in the life that we have and even in the death that is to come. We love him by being prepared for that moment, not being wary of death, not being fearful of death, but looking forward to that moment. It is a love that we can have. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. And so whether in life or in death, we will magnify him. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, in multiple occasions, for, for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He, he's hard-pressed between the two. The love that he can showcase and the life that he lives here on the earth, but also the love that he can have in death that he can showcase for an eternity. And that moves us to the final verse. With that incredible thought in mind. The love that we have here on this earth with the people that we come in contact with, with the world and its things is a love that will end. But a love that we can have for God is a love that is eternal. And so the final verse, in mansions of glory, an endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown again on my brow if ever I loved thee my Jesus tis now in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning there in verse 3 he says as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us an exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is this idea, this picture, That ultimately we can sing for eternity praise and adoration and love for Christ. Over and over and over and over again. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, it says here, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. An incredible, incredible letter and poem written about our love for Christ. It is a powerful sentiment, a powerful picture that we have. Now for us this morning, as we bring our thoughts to a close, Kevin is going to lead us in this song here in just a moment. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing it together here in just a minute. But I'm going to ask you to do just a couple of things. As we've worked our way through the song, it's in our mind. I'm going to ask as we're singing and as we're thinking about it, if these words ring true for you, And this is the love that you have for Christ. This is the level of love that you have for Christ. I would encourage you in your singing of this song to let God know about that and how you sing this song. But also be reminded of this. I would encourage you, do not ring hollow words in these forms of promises that you make to God this morning. This is love for Christ. It is deep love for him. It is high level commitment, a song like this. And the depth given to us 
by a 16-year-old boy. It's incredible to think about. But an incredibly strong sentiment. And so I ask you to stand as we're going to sing this song together. Kevin's going to come to the front and lead us. At the conclusion of this song, you can remain standing. We'll extend an invitation for just a couple of quick seconds, and then we'll sing the invitation of the song. Let's stand and sing this song together. Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me, and purchased my pardon. On Calvary Street, I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. I love thee. cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now in mansions of glory and in lusty light. I'll Jesus is now.